Good evening, guys. Welcome to video three, uh, three of Let's Just Ban Governments, Questionnaires, and also Rebuttals to Immigration, Refugees, and all the other good stuff that we've been talking about here lately. So I decided earlier today I was going to do this video in two parts, and then I thought about what my rebuttal on the refugee crisis would be, and I'm like, you know what? Never mind. I'm just going to do it all at once. So you guys will have to bear with me. I'm going to be doing a little bit longer of a video, and I know you guys don't like to sit there and watch them, but I do appreciate you guys tuning in. So just to kind of kick off, I really want to thank you guys all for the questionnaire I had last time. The last, for the last first two I've done, two? Yeah, two. <laughs> I've done, I've been a little bit wimpy on the questions, but this one was loaded and there's a whole bunch from here. So let's get it taken care of and get started. So um, starting off, J the Jacobite, Jacobite, I think that's how you pronounce his name, or Jacobite, I don't have a clue. Um, he said, do you think secession is, a con is constitutional or not? So... Going from the idea of the Constitution, I believe that it is going to be constitutional for a couple of reasons. First and reason being the Constitution's ideal was to protect people's rights. And people do have the right to say if they want to be under a certain government or if they want to leave that government and go somewhere else. As of today, we do not restrict somebody who wants to hop on a plane and move to Switzerland if they want to. So there is no reason why we should be able to exclude people from being able to take an entire part of their part of the country and make their own if they decide to leave the United States of America. So yes, it is constitutional, should have been during the Civil War, Lincoln should not have stepped in and done anything about that, but history's history, we cannot change it. 1035 asked me, why does my husband beat me up? I say it's probably because you don't make good enough sandwiches. Uh, Vol Random Drum Set says, would you ever support a violent government overthrow such as the one in the Revolutionary War? And my answer to this question is going to be generally, I am not a very violent person. I really just am not. I don't see violence. I've never been a person to fight back or view violence that way. I've always had a negative attitude towards violence. Probably one reason why when I was a Republican there, I was always a little bit edgy on my views of being a uh, military interventionist. And then I kind of found Ron Paul and Rand Paul, and that kind of took me this direction where I am today. So, yes, I would. But on very strict circumstances, being it that the government has pretty much plowed down my door and they need to be wiped out. Um, I'm not going to be a fan of anything that's going on in Baltimore or Ferguson and that kind of stuff because it's not an actual overthrow of government. It's people being stupid and robbing things. You know, if you're going to actually create a war on government, I would want to actually follow, you know, a lot of people here are pro-Palestine or anything, but I'd want to follow the IDF's examples where when we invade the government, we actually give them notice of things and we actually treat the civilian or citizens of war as actual people rather than just going over there and kind of killing them off. Be decent and even times of war, um, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, if I was going to be going out and attacking the government, I'd want to attack actual government officials and the government use propaganda from small children or anything like that. Take extra precautions to actually not do that. Because honestly, your public image when you're doing that kind of stuff is going to be one of the most important things. So you want to make people see that you are the good guy and not the bad one. Um, the next question was from Logical Fallacies and it says, can America be fixed if in our lifetime? Yeah, hell yeah, it can be fixed in our lifetime. For crying out loud, tomorrow if the United States government cut off all of its welfare, we would have a balanced budget. Give it 18 years, we're debt free. <laughs> So not really something that cannot be done. It's just a matter that it won't be done. It's really kind of thing. So if I'm being realistic, probably not. Probably we're going to be doomed because Federal Reserve has pumped out more money than we have. We're probably going to collapse. Uh, America, as I've said before, doesn't understand any kind of concept about anything. So most likely I, I see the United States being something that is not around anymore. Maybe give it 30 years here. But yeah, it's fixable if we can just spread the idea of liberty and actually make it so it happens. But doubt that's going to happen. Uh, the next question is from Laissez Faire, and he asks, "What is the most viable path towards a libertarian America?" I'm going to answer that question with, "How did you discover libertarianism?" Uh, quite simply, the very same way through freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of exchanging ideas. I don't think there's a single person on this app that maybe you have the few people who grew up maybe in a libertarian home, but there's probably not many people on here that had a guy that came up to you and said, "You know what? You're such a retard because you're so against military interventionist, isolationist, isolationist, and..." Or no, sorry, you're you're so for military intervention, all that good stuff. You know, you need you need to stop doing that, bombing other people. You know, and this came off rude to you. We all became libertarians because we looked up the facts, we looked into history, we looked into um, being more reason and rationale in our beliefs. And so, the idea of being able to spread libertarianism and to be able to take that rationale, that reason, and implement it into other people's heads, and through that is by being decent human beings and expressing expressing our ideas through ways that other people would find feasible. So. That's probably going to be the best way to do it. I don't think there's any other way you really could do it. 
Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not a fan of the violent protest that, you know, through anarchy and everything like that. I'm more of a peaceful kind of guy. So freedom of speech, always try to get that pushed through. That's one reason why they hate freedom of speech. But hey, um, the next question was from Fist Cheer. It says, at what point would you take up arms against the government or would you? Um, honestly, to be completely honest with you right now, if the gov- if citizens of the United States started having a revolution where they started going up against the government, I would be full on board grabbing the gun, go out the door and helping them out. I mean, like I said, I think the government's to the point where it needs to be overthrown. But as I previously stated, has to be within the terms that are decent. We can't be war criminals just because we don't like the government. We have to actually be able to do things appropriately. Um, so I'm at the stage already. <laughs> Uh, most likely during FDR's reign. I've probably been at that stage too, Woodrow Wilson, all of them, Theodore Roosevelt. I would have thrown up arms against them as well. Anybody who violates my rights deserves to not be in power. But we do have peaceful methods about going around that nowadays, so violent revolution is not something that I deem appropriate in all circumstances. Uh, The next question is from Rothenstein. He says, in your opinion, is anarchy different than the state of nature? Uh, I did a little bit of research on this question before I truly answered it. There are a lot of different things I found out about a state of nature. Some people view it as a state of nature is more like the social construct or social contract thing where we have a duty to protect our other people. I view it, from what I've read so far, more of what John Locke said as it being something that we have rights of our own properties that we shall not inflict upon others, anything that we would not inflict upon ourselves, have respect to people's properties, their belongings, all that good stuff. Um, John Locke also got most of his ideas off his Christian philosophy that most of morality is kind of objective and what people believe. They might consciously object to it or they might even subconsciously kind of ignore it sometimes. But as a whole, we kind of view things in a good light. For instance, the idea that murder is always condoned in most people's views and then love is always promoted. Even in societies where things have gone corrupt, it's still in the background of those people something that they actually hold uphold. So I kind of lean more of that direction. And honestly, no. I mean, it really isn't. Anarchy is going to be a state of nature whatever that state of nature was to begin with, um, just to be more, hopefully, free. Um, the Incorruptible asks, what's ANCAP, how are its inhabitants covered, and taxed? Well, if you're an ANCAP, you're not being taxed. <laughs> That's flat out. There's no taxes for an ANCAP society because they don't do that. You're giving your money freely to institutions to protect you or to do services for you. Um, most likely, and people think that this wouldn't happen, but I mean, in Lima, Ohio, where I grew up, is actually something that the county government does there. They actually say, hey, county, we need taxes. Will you give us this amount? You know, what amount of taxes do you want to pay for us? And the county actually chooses what they give them. It's a voluntary exchange, uh, which is kind of cool for actually going to grow up in that little town there. It's something that would actually happen. Oop, drop my pen. But it's actually something that did happen and does happen in today's society. So most likely that's kind of going, going through. I imagine, though, a lot of people bring up the issue of what if somebody gets a hold of nuclear warheads. I would also like to point out that there's never been a private citizen that's ever owned nuclear warheads. It's only been governments. And generally, governments have been the ones that create most violent things, be it nuclear warheads, hydrogen bombs, everything else like that. Society as a whole has no intention of destroying things. The people don't want to break and kill and do all sorts other good stuff. It's usually at the expense of governments and their own power that creates those kind of circumstances. So uh, the inhabitants would be governed by having separate forces that... Um, protect their property and sue other companies through kind of a common law principle to be civilized you don't want to go over and start shooting up the other companies there because that would lose you business and everything Uh, taxes would be voluntarily you wouldn't really have much of any kind of voluntarily that's what i assume would happen like i said i'm still on that border as a confused ancap is what i call myself so i'm on that border there i'll call myself a libertarian and an ancap half the time i'm right on that border so i'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly a whole lot about it but uh that's your question answered uh, Rothbard, Rothbard, I'm always terrible at pronouncing names, so I've got to pronounce stuff wrong, you have to forgive me guys, but it says, what do you think about Bernie? I honestly would be really upset of America if we elected Bernie Sanders for a couple reasons. First reason being that I was really on the hopes a long time ago that the United States as a young, young population, we were growing out of statism and going into more of a libertarian society. From every like poll I was reading a while ago, it said like 43% of young Americans identify as libertarians, and then all of a sudden the move amongst young libertarians for or you move amongst young people for uh, Bernie Sanders started, and it's just like, ugh, damn it. But no, um, socially, he'd be awesome. I mean, he really would for doing his stance on drugs and a couple other things. When it comes to more of your constitutional rights with guns, awful minimum wage, he'd kill the economy. I mean, he'd just put us in a hole. <laughs> be worse. He'd probably, like, cause, kind of probably cause a great depression, number two, because, you know, all that good stuff for him. When it comes to healthcare system, I think he has the completely wrong idea. If you want to make it a one-payer system, you do have to make it so that free market capitalism is invoked inside the idea 
of that system. Uh, you can't just have it so the government controls everything. Else. Like I said before, you're going to have a, cap, a Canada system where people die waiting on a waiting list. Or like we had the VA. Not good stuff. Um, so, I mean, Bernie's going to one of those people that he's not going to affect me too much because I make enough that I feel like the, my business would keep me employed or employed if they had to increase my, minimum, increase my wage a little bit because it's not going to be that much for me. Um, when it comes to healthcare and stuff like that, I'm pretty well taken care of. So it's one of those things where as a citizen who values other people's rights, I'm going to be objecting to him, but he won't affect me so much. So there it is. Uh, Jolly Jeff asks, what is the purpose of marriage to wed two people that want to be together the rest of their lives? And in some cases nowadays to give the government ability to give them benefits, basically what it is nowadays. Yeah. It doesn't really have any great significant value to me. It's just kind of been thrown out the window. Just like, no, I mean. To me, it'd be more of, if I'm looking at what my marriage would be, it'd be with somebody who I love dearly and want to have with me for the rest of my life and have that um, relationship endowed and shared with my Savior, Jesus Christ, God, that kind of stuff. Um, hold on a second. Sorry about that. My phone was dying. I had to fix that real quick. Um, anyways, next question was from Jolly Jeff again. It says, who, what is the pre-mortal sacrament? I think that's something about a Catholic faith there. I'm not entirely sure. I've heard a little bit about it, but I haven't read into the entire concept a little bit more. But I believe that's like something of like the Jesus and humanity thing, where they have the whole entire sacrament of the Eucharist, you, 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 you whatever that is, and all that good stuff. Um, not entirely sure. I didn't really look into it much before I did this. I don't really follow much of anything at all on the lines of the Catholics there, so uh, no one, I guess. I'm not entirely sure. I probably just made myself look like a fool. I don't really care. I don't even know what it really is. So... Um, next question says from Jolly Jeff, and it's the question, I don't, okay, um, it says, what if there is a place where past, present, and future are all experienced at once and an ever-present now? Do you think that the creatures of free will can change their minds and decisions in said place? I'm assuming you mean that if everyone was able to experience the past, future, and present, would you be able to change your mind about stuff? Um, the thing would be Yes because you could change your mind about what happened in the past, present, or future if you wanted to, or your mind would be set in stone. I mean, I don't understand what you're even trying to ask me there. Like, what, like, technically, yes, you'd be able to change your mind, but would you? I don't know. I, it's too late. I don't really care enough to have this. My negatarian is getting a little bit of revenge on me from the questions I asked him, which he had really good answers for, by the way. I do thank him back because it made me laugh a little bit. He asked me, do you have any fetishes? And yes, I do. I have several fetishes, but none of them are for you. So uh, if you really want a list of what those fetishes are, you can go ahead and get hold of a little to the right, who is, well, hi, babes. <laughs> um, well, she knows those fetishes, so you can ask her for that. Uh, my negatarian says, how many feet? I am six foot three. Woohoo! Uh, another half foot somewhere else. I have two feet and I have massive feet. I'm like 12, size 12, size 13 sometimes, but they're not really long. They're really wide. So I'm like a big foot, I have big hands and everything, all that good stuff. Um, next question was from Jolly Jeff. Again, it says, in a future economy where nearly all manual labor is completed by machines and robots, how do you think the workforce would be affected? What most labor convert would most labor convert into desk jobs? Would the education required to get low-wage jobs be higher than it was before? Um, so this is actually a good question of his. I actually like it. So I actually am personally kind of adopting the idea that most likely what will happen is that in the future economy, um, and there have been some articles, if you go let's read this, stuff, there's some comments that say that by the year 2020 or something like that, like 60% of the United States population will be unemployed because they predict the jobs that are existing in our current economy will no longer exist because of industrialization. So... Obviously, if we look back in time when most of the population in the United States, about like 75% was farmers, that was a big crisis. Most of the farmers, when John Deere came up, were like, no, 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 we can't have tractors and everything because that's going to ruin our jobs and take away from our economy. But what happened because of that was people started working into the technology field, um, bust in industrialization, and then it kind of created the entire world as we know it with everything tech-related. Because, you know, most people don't work on farms any nowadays. They work more in tech fields. Um, so most likely you'll see some sort of industrialization, like kind of build up like that again. I have absolutely no idea what that would be because it's kind of like trying to predict the existence of the Internet. There's no way to be able to do that back when you're in the 1800s. Um, but hopefully, though, I'm really, 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 really hoping that it's like a space exploration thing because I would love to be able to travel space. It'd be awesome because I hope that's kind of what happens there as so the space exploration becomes our next adventure because we become so tech that we can do that. You know, it'd be awesome. Great. But 
that's my theory. Uh, I do not believe most laborers will become desk jobs. Personally, I hope not. I hate desk jobs. It's just like meh. Um, Jolly Jeff asked me if we were, if, sorry, if we were to switch to a gold silver backed currency, how would we pay off our debt? Assuming we don't find any large gold or silver deposits. Uh, if we did that, most likely the government would rein its debt a little bit because it has no ability to just print money to spend more money. Um, there is also, I heard a couple studies a while ago about the actual natural resources we have in this land along the lines of gas, oil, and all this other good stuff. That seems like a little bit of a potential that we could tap into to actually kind of boost our economy somewhat. I have predictions too that if the next president is something that's going to try to boost the economy, they're most likely going to try to provoke um, a little bit of you know emotional tiles or ethos into actually going into doing that. Uh, if you've, I think the Blaze has a couple good articles out about how much money we actually have in the ground here in America that we could use to kind of boost, bust back our uh, economy in a little bit. And also we could just stop creating debt and actually let people like Rand Paul who are going to create a surplus rather than a debt. So yeah, let's do that instead. Um, so the next question was from David L. Should the government be allowed to take the organs of somebody after death if they did not want to be an organ donor? And the answer to this question is kind of straightforward. No, they should not be able to because that person before they had, di had di or before they had died had complete control over their body. They are the only thing that gives them absolute control over that. So to say that they're going to take the organs from that is kind of a violation of their rights and their wishes after death. And I think most of us would look upon that and kind of gross that someone's going to cut open your body at the expense of the state and give it to someone else. It's kind of like the welfare after you're dead, you know, <laughs> like, hey, you can't redistribution of your organs is next. Welcome to the IRS. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Jewish Kajman asked me, how do you feel about me? And to be honest to you, little man, I actually kind of missed the entire thing with the CFL a little bit. I felt bad after that, and you guys saw me apologize for what happened there. I just kind of saw it was going down the wrong hill. But I do miss the friendship I used to have with John F. Kennedy, you, The Economist, and Gladfly, or Quebecadorian, and a whole entire group of people. It was kind of a nice time, and actually probably one of the better times I had of a profile on iFunny. I do miss that, so uh, I guess with kind of a more of a sweet rendezvous or micro suite um whatever the term is for remembering things that kind of thing it's kind of how i feel about you i'm very impartial i don't hate you I'm just kind of there but i do miss you guys uh and the fed asks what's the best kind of mountain dew always straight real original man don't go anything different but i do like the red stuff and i like the other things they have but if you're on a late night crunch and you have a 10 page immigration paper that's due the next day <laughs> um regular mountain dew will get you the job done i like dr pepper too so uh Ars Muncher, 1197, I think that's your name there, asks, should exchange rates be fixed, pegged, or floating? Well, I thought that fixed and pegged meant one of the same thing, where they're situated and stuck in thing, and that'd be kind of more if the uh, Federal Reserve, for instance, followed a gold standard and met the money, so the currency was situated on gold standard. It did not fluctuate in the market, depending on its demand or thing. It was set to a standard of having a gold currency to it. Um, so if the United States is going to have a currency... I believe it should be pegged or fixed to the gold standard where the government is making it so it's valuable to the exact amount of gold, which produces a high value currency and keeps us competitive in the market. Um, everything else though, I'm not a big fan of the government saying that we have to use the United States currency because I feel like if we had competitive cur currencies, we'd be like, oh yeah, the US dollar is worth not, not worth anything anymore. Let's go to Bitcoin, that kind of stuff. So United States government, they're going to be smart. We peg it to the gold standard. Anyone else, if they want to have a floating currency, I mean, I don't care. Free market for the win. You choose what you want to do. Um, Monetarian asked me, to make a long fucking story short, I try to shove an entire bag of jelly beans up my ass. Good for you, man. Um, and then I'm going to ask, like, look at the next comment there. Historical Chronicles said, overall, who do you think as being the Democratic and the Republican nominee for the presidential race in 2016? That truly depends on what's going to happen here the next few months. I still have really high hopes for Rand Paul because I think there's a lot of people out there who are not being polled in the polls that actually support him. I've actually had several conversations with random people at Best Buy. I feel like for some reason my persona just makes it feel like people should just tell me their political opinions. So I've actually had like three really good conversations with people over the past week here about how Rand Paul should be president. So <laughs> yay for that. Um, but Democratic, I see Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. Probably one of the two there. I do not see anybody else, mostly because Hillary Clinton's just, well, political corrupt and the media is going to give her everything she wants. And Bernie Sanders has a lot of support amongst young people because of his ideas of free college. Um, that's probably the only reason why he's being really well, too, because people don't understand economics. And they say, ooh, free stuff. Give me free stuff. I like free stuff. It's kind of like they voted for Barack Obama because he was black. Um, Republican, most likely probably Rubio or Trump. 
I see those two kind of coming into play there a little bit. I know a lot of hardcore Republicans that like Rubio's stances on a few things, even though I feel like he's just a giant baby in a huge diaper. Um, Trump is just an idiot overall, but we can kind of see how stupid the Republican um, collection or collective there is in supporting him. I'm a little bit disappointed about that, but most likely one of those two still kind of hoping my hopes up for Rand Paul. If he keeps up how he's doing in the debates here, he's probably going to have some chance there. So I'm hoping, 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 hoping. And then last but not least, flat tax capitalist asked me, capital gains tax rate up, down, or stay the same? And obviously down, down, down of all taxes. Burn them to the ground. Get rid of them. I don't care they are. Get rid of them. I don't care who's taxing or what is taxing. Get rid of it. And what's this government? If the government can make a tax upon itself, that'd be kind of cool. And I imagine they could probably do it because that seems kind of not effective at all, but they would do it. So that's the only tax I would support. But other than that, uh, down, down of everything. Don't give me more taxes. So uh, that was the questionnaire here. Next on to the actual barrel I have for um, life according to Econ and my negatarian. Two things I'm going to say. My negatarian had some very, very excellent points in his last kind of videos there, addressing a few things I was kind of a little bit muffled in my tired sleep and did not address last time. If you have not seen those videos yet, as always, I always say go ever watch everybody's videos. You know the drill. Go do it. I republish them. You can watch them. He took a little bit longer than I would have liked for him to do, but they are still good videos, so please do go watch them. Um, the only other thing I would say, dude, is if you're going to make the argument about protecting our borders, you should also address the fact that if we allow more immigrants in or more refugees in, they are going to have to be screened, whereas if someone's trying to commit a terrorist attack, they most likely would be able to be picked up on that and will be trying to cross the border illegally. So rather than having a flood of like 11.9 million people crossing the border illegally, you'd have 11.9 million people going into an open border system with only a few people trying to cross the border. So you'd be able to pick off who those terrorist threats were. Kind of has a little bit more of the defense there, kind of like of the NSA having all that information. It makes no sense for them that information. They should dial it down to actually have the information that matters. That kind of argument. But I thought I would address, uh, um, what's his name? Life According to Econ's post there about the welfare system and actually give you guys a few numbers because I've been talking about how welfare should not be something we should restrict immigration on. He's been talking about how it'll make us cost a whole lot of money a lot more money, and I feel like you should actually know what the price of having refugees would be inside this country. So, starting off, uh, my notes tool here was going to be that you should also know that right now, from a couple of webpages I was looking up, it looks about that of the Syrian refugees, there are 4 million refugees that are currently searching for refugees to be able to hide. <laughs> This is not all the refugees that the United States has taken in. In fact, the United States only takes in 95,000 refugees every year, with only 10,000 of those being Syrian refugees. So we actually take in a very small amount of refugees. And if you break that down to who all the refugees are in a sense of population or anything, um, and who's taking welfare, because I looked up a little bit, the refugees will be taking a form of welfare inside the United States. That means that one in 100, 125 people in the United States or welfare recipients in the United States are going to be some form of a refugee. So this is also kind of another lesson for you guys about statistics to how that looks like a bigger number than what it actually is. One, one out of 125 um, welfare recipients are refugees. So that's kind of a thing you should pay attention to. Statistics can be manipulated, but that's one statistic there. So in 2011, the United States spent over $109 million, 631,109 million, six hundred thirty-one thousand dollars on welfare. Um, or sorry, no, that's how many, blah, blah, I'm a little bit tired here, you can't forgive me. That was how many people were receiving welfare, not how much it spent, sorry. 109,631,000 people in the United States were receiving welfare, which is about 35% of the population. Um, the United States in that year spent a $1.03 trillion on welfare, which if you do the math there, and I did it for you, it adds up to being $11,858 per person on welfare every year. If we take the refugees, that makes it 1 million, 120, oh, I'm sorry, 1 trillion. That's not right here. Hold on a second. I wrote down wrong numbers. Uh, okay, 1 million, 126,510 dollars for the refugees. No, that's not right. Oh, the bit of the words. Back up. I need to start doing these things a lot sooner in the day. 1 billion, 126 million, 510,000 dollars for refugees. Now, if we break that across the population of the United States of a three or a 3.19 million people here, that adds up, that adds up to being only $3.53 from each person in the United States every year. 
So if we allowed in refugees at the current rate, now this is saying I didn't take what the Syrian refugees were, I only took what we take in a whole right now, which is like I said, 95,000. If we add more refugees, let's say that we double the amount we take in, that would make it so that you're only spending about $7.06 on refugees if we took in a 1 million and 18 or 800 refugees. So when we think about the numbers here on the welfare system, it is important to remember that welfare split across the collective of the United States here is going to be a very, very small amount if we actually lose refugees in. Now, I'm not saying that what Life According to Econ says is not a very valid argument. Obviously, I do not want the state of aggression against me any more than he does. I don't want welfare increasing upon my tax burden or even in the deficit. But if we're going to look at the argument, the two arguments you should see, my point of view is that welfare is less important than the lives of these individuals who are trying to seek refugee. His argument is that the lives of these individuals are less important than the welfare. That's really what the two arguments are that are between there. Um, but I figured you guys should at least know, sorry, excuse me, uh, know what the numbers were there. Also something that came important, like I said too, about checking refugees and everything like that, it should also be noted that the refugees have one of the most extraneous like security checks of any person leaving and entering in this country here, where they have to go through the State Department, they have to go through Homeland Security, they have to go through the Department of Health, they have to go through the Human Service, and several other organizations they have to check to actually be able to come inside this country. So if we allow more immigrants or more refugees to come inside the country here, they're going to be screened, or streamed, blah, 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 words, screened heavily compared to most other people. And that also leads to my point, if we allow people to come in through the legal way where they are screened, the good people are going to go do that, while the illegal ones, or the ones who want to create terrorist attacks, are going to cry across the border, which would make it a lot easier for our border patrol to actually catch them and stop them before they commit the acts. Um, that is a couple of arguments I'd like to point out about that. But, like I said, if we did it, it'd be about $7.00. Uh, six cents for each person if we just doubled our immigrants that we took in and allowed more refugees to come to the country here for you. So $7, so that's what you're looking in welfare increasements versus uh, 1 million people coming into the country there. So um, that was really just my entire little rebuttal there. I wanted to throw those two things in for you. I'm not any more fair and fun or whatever it is with the welfare system thing, but it is. But I like to look at the facts. That's what the facts are. I made my little notes here. So if you want to double check them or do a rebuttal against it, there you are. Um, that's all I have to talk about. I really didn't have anything else to talk about. Uh, the only thing is that I'm really, really hoping that life according to Econ and I kind of get our shit together and we actually do a video this this next week in here because we're going to do a, hopefully a podcast. So something else below in the comments here, guys, please post any questions you have for me, life according to Econ. I might send out the invitation to my Negatarian and see if he wants to get on there or maybe Rothenstein and see if those one guys want to join us into a questionnaire, maybe a little debunkle battle thing between the three of us. Um, hopefully maybe this Saturday, Sunday, or even Monday that we will be actually posting that and you guys can watch that. So yes, maybe below in the comments, ask questions, make topics you want us to discuss. Um, you know that you'll have me as a very adamant Christian going up against an agnostic and I think, I don't know what my Negatarian is, so if you want to ask philosophy questions, we can debate those too. I do not mind going up against that. Um, yeah, so ask questions, guys. I do appreciate you guys watching it once more. This has been Let's Just Ban Government, making my third questionnaire, fourth, fifth, whatever it is, rebuttal, according to this thing. Just kind of seeing a few facts there. Have a good night, guys. Take care. God bless.